All right, well, I think we'll make a start if that's okay with everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. This is part of our um, regular construction law updates. Um, some introductions, my name is James Vernon and I'm a partner at Beale & Co. Um, and I'm joined by Jack Swaddling, who's an associate with us. Together, we're part of our construction group providing non-contentious and contentious advice for the construction, engineering and infrastructure sectors. Um, we're a specialist law firm in the film of domestic and international construction and insurance law. Uh, we've been providing advice in complex disputes around the world for over 50 years. And we were doing that with contractors, developers, consultants, investors and employers, uh, as well as the insurance industry providing solutions for construction. Um, we've got over 100 lawyers now, um, over four offices, London, Bristol, um, Dublin and Dubai. Um, and we've got a brand new website, so if you need any more information on that, please check that out. Um, we have over 360 people that have signed up for today from across the UK um, and from different parts of the construction sector, so that's fantastic. And we hope you find this webinar informative. So the agenda, this, this is what we're going to endeavour to get through in an hour. There's quite a lot. Um, there'll, be some, there'll be some occasions where we will be referring to what's on the slide and the slides will be provided afterwards. So um, hopefully that should stop some hand cramps um, trying to scribble down everything that's on it. Um, so firstly, we will set the scene with a brief introduction of what adjudication is based on the original aims and how those have been maintained and developed over the last 25 years. Um, and we'll, I'll briefly set out the typical timetable and we, we use the word typical lightly because although statute says it should be a 28 day process that very rarely happens but often for good reasons. Um, then we'll put ourselves in the shoes of a referring party uh, and we'll go through some steps to consider when you are considering to bring an adjudication and uh, as a way of sort of an examples we're going to use the three main or common types of disputes which are valuation disputes defects and delay. Um, we'll then hop over the fence and put ourselves into the responding party's shoes and consider the steps you should be taking to when threatened with and facing an adjudication, um, including jurisdiction, which is obviously a very big part of what adjudication is. Um, we'll briefly consider the uh, adjudicator's decision and enforcement, but, but again, as with jurisdiction, that could be a, a whole topic uh, in itself. So um, it will be a, a brief guide of just the steps you can take. Uh, and, and finally, we'll look at some recent case law and where this fits into the adjudication process. And there's been some key decisions in the, in the, in the last 12 to 18 months, um, which, which has guided what is to be done. Um, Please feel free to ask questions during the session. Um, you should have on your panel a, a, an option to do that. Um, we will endeavour to answer uh, some at the end if we've got time, but all questions are collated and we can follow those up with the person who's raised it. So starting with the aims of adjudication and what is it? Um, it's a dispute resolution process uh, for construction contracts that aims to give a quick decision which is binding on the parties and less than until uh, determined by a court of arbitration or an agreement between the parties. Um, it was introduced in um, 1996 by the uh, Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, which gave the statutory right to adjudication. And that came out of the Latham report saying that more needed to be done to aid cash flow. So that was the aim. It was supposed to be a mechanism by which money disputes could be resolved during projects quickly and without the need of risking client relationships, but also not waiting to the end and having to start court proceedings, which were generally much more time consuming and, and expensive. So the adjudication was to be a quick process during the project. Parties bear their own costs. Let's keep going on with the rest of the project while this happens. Um, one of the important aspects of adjudication and, and the, the idea for speed was that it was, was to be for a dispute, not multiple disputes. Um, so you can't sort of lump a whole issue, lots, lots of issues on a project into one adjudication. It has to be a dispute. But that said, the dispute can have a number of elements. So uh, an, an account variation dispute that might have a number of separate variations, that can still be a an adjudication, a single adjudication, because the items that make up that uh, variation account is the single dispute. 
But if you run a claim alongside that, for example, for a loss and, loss and expense claim or, or, or more likely a, an entitlement to an extension of time, that would be multiple disputes and could fall foul. Um, today, adjudication is still used as its original aim, which is to resolve payment disputes um, in a quick and effective way. Um, but the Act did not seek to restrict the types of disputes that could be adjudicated and also when they can be adjudicated. A party to a construction contract can adjudicate at any time, and that includes after the project has been finished, obviously within limitation um, periods. So in the last 25 years, adjudication has been commenced for complex disputes, including those listed on the side, defects, professional negligence, contractual declarations. And they are seen as a useful tool because of the quick nature of the decision and they can unlock issues. Um, the parties may not necessarily be happy with the decision that's made, but it can give some assistance to them in moving forward. Um, the type of dispute, though, does have an impact on the process for adjudication. Um, it, it has a bearing on jurisdiction in terms of what you need to do to ensure that a dispute has crystallised and to ensure that the right to natural justice isn't breached. Um, and then on timetable that the parties deliver, you know, the more complex, the less likely you are going to be sticking to a 28 day timetable and you can get adjudications that run for months um, with the party's consent because it's seen as a, as a better way of dealing with the issues. Well, in terms of the typical timetable, uh, this is on the slide and it starts with the notice of adjudication. Um, so the dispute is crystallised, you want to keep, you want to crack on, you issue your notice. Um, this sets the time frame running, the referral has to be served within seven days of the notice. And because the time for the decision um, runs the referral, that's why we call it day minus seven. Once you issue your notice, you appoint the adjudicator, that's either someone named in the contract or you go to an adjudicator nominating body such as the RICS. Um, a key point to note is you have to serve the notice first before you go to appoint the adjudicator. You can't do it at the same time, you know, under the same email or in advance. Um, you must serve the notice first. If you if you do it the wrong way around, you could be left with an unenforceable decision. So if you have made that mistake, it's safer to start again because in reality you probably have only lost two to three days. Um, the Notice of adjudication sets out the redress sort and it provides the jurisdiction for the adjudicator on what he has to consider. So you've got an adjudicator, you then serve your referral. Um, one of the things that we'll go on to say is the referral is the lengthy document akin to a particular claim. It sets out your full case. It has any supporting documents attached to it. It should be ready before you serve the notice of adjudication. There can be a lot to do in that seven day period, even though you don't expect it. And so to then be expected to draft the referral in that window, um, it, it, it's not sensible. So it's always good to have everything ready and then you issue the notice. Um, depending on the complexity of the matter and how generous the adjudicator is feeling, you can get between seven and 14 days to a, for a response. Uh, it's still the case that the party who brings the claim tends to get the last word. So they will get the opportunity to serve a reply, but they won't have long to do that. We're looking at between three and seven days for that. Um, and then 28 days from the referral, the decision is issued. As I said, the timetable can be extended on agreements, but the, and the conduct of the whole process is at the adjudicator's discretion. So if the adjudicator considers more submissions are needed, he can invite the parties to do that. If he considers a meeting is useful, that can be convened. Uh, the adjudicator can also raise specific queries and as a party, you need to react to them. So it's not necessarily a case of serve the referral, sit back, wait 28 days and get the decision. Um, it, it is a proactive process. Jack. Thank you very much, James. Um, so first, um, I'm going to be looking at some of the practical steps that the referring party should be um, looking to take uh, before commencing a referral and I'm going to be looking at um, some of the main types of dispute. So that's going to start with uh, the smash and grab referrals um, followed by a re review of uh, disputes concerning true value of works um, and claims arising from defects and delay. Um, now smash and grab adjudications are the most common type of uh, dispute referred and, and that's for good reason. Um, 
this is perhaps uh, they encapsulate the intended purpose of the process um, to uh, maintain cash flow on projects um, and they do not depend on uh, substantial evidence of fact um, you're relying on a, a default by a paying party uh, by their failure to serve a payment notice or a pay less notice um, giving rise to an entitlement under the payment bargain to the contract um, and uh, the right of the, uh, the, the, the payee um, is to enforce that payment bargain um, as soon as the default in service of proper notice by the payer um, arises. Um, so uh, these should generally be um, pretty straightforward uh, claims to prepare. Um, in terms of crystallization, um, picking up on the point that James mentioned earlier, um, the right of the uh, referring party to commence a smash and grab adjudication will crystallize on the payment notice or pay less notice confirming the sums that are disputed in the application that's submitted by the payee. Um, and so the dispute can be commenced very quickly off the back of an interim application. Um, so I, I, I think much of the uh, the rules applying to the to the payment process and what's imported by the Act will probably be familiar to the um, uh, the audience today. Um, qualified construction contra contracts under the Act must provide an adequate payment mechanism, providing for interim payments, typically based on applications submitted by the payee for the value of work completed up to defined due dates. Um, and uh, payers must respond by issuing compliant payment or pay less notices. Um, if the qualifying contract does not provide a compliant payment mechanism, con uh, the Construction Act will incorporate provisions um, of the scheme. Uh, this can lead to situations where paying parties can find themselves on the wrong side of a referral as a result of being unaware of the terms of the payment bargain that was brought into the contract under the Construction Act. Um, and so the claim uh, turns on the, uh, the default entitlement of the, uh, of, of, of the payee to receive payment of the notified sum. Um, and so, uh, as I say, the preparing a referral should be relatively straightforward. That's providing um, the payee has uh, understood and complied with uh, the pay, their obligations under the contract to um, serve a valid application. Um, but that's not to say that disputes can't arise um, and often matters become rather more complicated. Um, uh, and so uh, particularly if the contract doesn't set out the payment mechanism in detail, the parties haven't been complying with it during the course of the project. Um, I'll, I'll later discuss a recent case uh, which concerned a successful challenge to enforcement of a smash and grab referral. Uh, on grounds of likely manifest injustice arising from enforcement of the decision. Um, although this is perhaps of limited application, the policy of the courts is very much to enforce the payment bargain under the contract and default payment entitlements. And so now moving on to valuation disputes. Now, a valuation referral uh, in contrast to your smash and grab claim, this uh, goes to the heart of what's owed either on interim or, or final account basis for the works completed up to a certain date. Uh, true valuation referrals will, will often comprise numerous disagreements and subclaims in an account. Um, and so this sort of links into the point raised earlier by James about whether there's one dispute or multiple disputes under a contract. Um, a, 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 a valuation dispute on a final account can include all manner of, of, of subclaims uh, and disputes regarding various entitlements that the payee has uh, requested payment for and the payer disputes their entitlement to and it won't necessarily be limited to a matter of um, the measurement of the work on the ground. Um, but uh, that's not necessarily to say that uh, the adjudicator won't have power to make a decision on what the entitlement is that arises from it. So uh, it could include 
as I say, work completed up to the due date, whether work is instructed as a variation um, uh, and, and can include or parties can seek to bring in claims for loss and expense arising from culpable disruption of programmes work. Um, understandably, where there are numerous disputed valuation claims under an account, referrals can become rather long and complicated. Um, I, I think our advice would often be for a referring party in such a situation to consider uh, dealing with individual subclaims on, a, on an item by item basis to limit the scope of argument. Uh, perhaps by seeking declarations on individual entitlements that could perhaps unlock an impasse um, or at least change the approach of a, a recalcitrant payer. Um, so the approach in preparing the referral notice uh, will require the referring party to set out both the legal and factual basis of each disputed valuation item. Whilst uh, contractors can rely on evidence prepared by their management or, or, or internal quantity surveyors, more significant claims will often warrant the, uh, the input by a specialist independent expert. Um, referring parties should seek to avoid merely asking an adjudicator to assess and agree their valuation um, uh, without proper substantiation for all the items that are being pursued. Um, adjudication is by and large a paper-based exercise and adjudicators won't take it upon themselves to establish the facts of their own initiative um, or the valuation of work that's actually being completed on the site, absent of evidence to demonstrate it, as this would open them up to potential challenges on enforcement. Um, so the referring party carries the burden. If you're preparing this type of a claim, it's well worth investing the time well before serving the notice to make sure uh, all the ducks are in a row. Um, so moving on to the next slide and looking a bit more at the preparation of type of valuation type disputes. Uh, disputes regarding the extent of work completed is largely factual. Uh, we need to produce evidence to show at an interim valuation date what work has been done. Uh, in contractors, this is usually shown by a percentage against the schedule of works, which will be given a difference of opinion as the extent of work that's actually been completed. Um, typical evidence you would hope to include in this type of referral would be contemporaneous state evidence. Um, if that evidence uh, is produced uh, on, on the data, uh, on the actual valuation date in question, that's certainly helpful. But um, things like photographs, progress reports, meeting minutes, site records such as um, invoices, records for operative checking into site, um, all of these sorts of things can uh, certainly help the adjudicator to form a view. Um, but obviously, that's bearing in mind the point mentioned earlier that the adjudicator is not going to find the facts um, of, of, of his own volition by arranging a site meeting and to, uh, to, to carry out a measurement on his own. So, the more that can be provided to substantiate the valuations put forward, uh, the better. Um, for consultants, um, the situation will depend on on how the payments under their contract have been agreed. Um, often appointments with stage payments based on an agreed based fee, and these would generally be likely to give rise to fewer valuation type disputes, uh, provided those stages are well defined. However, when the appointments based on an hourly rate of services carried out uh, in a payment period, this can give rise to differences of opinion as to what's being done and the reasonableness of charges. Um, and so things like time recording, records, that sort of thing um, are going to be beneficial. And if, if, if those can be prepared in a way that's, um, that's relatively detailed, all the better. Um, generally, in preparing this type of a claim, that it's the hard work that goes on by the referring party in advance of serving the notice, which will um, put them, set them in, in good stead and will, will reveal gaps in the evidence that need to be addressed. If there isn't material evidence, things can be picked up in witness statements prepared by parties involved in the work. But um, and that's often the case. You're dealing with a final account where works were completed some time ago, or perhaps an entitlement following a termination of a contract. But um, ideally, primary evidence is what you're looking for. So it's back over to you, James. Thanks, Jack. Um, 
the second example we were going to give, which goes a, a little bit towards Jack was saying, was, was claims for variations and the value. Um, variation disputes um, can be useful in adjudication because it can be a single issue. Um, and, and they have a legal and, and factual angle to them. For, from a legal perspective, what you're looking to establish as a referring party is firstly the clause under the contract or, or the appointment that entitles to a variation. So something has happened that will entitle you to an additional sum of money. Second thing to look at is often variation clauses come with some form of condition and precedent. So have you complied with the requirements of that clause? Have you given sufficient notice? If you are required to agree the scope of work or the potential cost of it prior to starting, have you followed that process? Showing that precedent has been discharged will be key. Um, thirdly, and this happens quite a lot, is, is where there are potential disputes as to whether it is in fact a variation and the degree of that variation. So this is not necessarily new work, this could be an extension to existing work or the actual paying party can consider the work should always have been part of the contract. Anything you can show that really clearly identifies the contract works and why this is all new work or the percentage of the work that is in addition, you'll be able to substantiate your valuation. Um, the, the factual evidence um, that will be required also includes what's in the contract in terms of rates allowed for. So what, what are your applicable rates? How have you measured this additional work that's a variation? So you're able to show that the exact sum on your case that should be added to the contract value is X. And this is based on, with cross-reference to drawings and photographs, how you have calculated that. Now, of course, as Jack says, that'll be part of the facts and that'll be answered by the responding party and it'll be for the adjudicator to decide who, who they prefer and, and potentially whether they want to do anything else. But if you don't have that evidence set up, your, your adjudication will be greatly undermined for a variation. And as with all things, when you're a referring party, you've got to look at what the responding party has previously said. Why have they rejected either that it's not a variation or they're not accepting the full value that you've claimed for? So preempting that in how you consider your approach and your investigation before starting it, it is very useful and a, and a step that should be taken. Um, just over to Jack, just before I go to Jack to talk about defects, um, we go back to the same point that there can be many variations on, on an account. And, and so there will be a degree of considering which, which claim is best for you um, in, in terms of what can you evidence um, and go for, your, go for your strongest ones. That can be seen death by a thousand cuts, um, but it can be a useful way to unlock issues. Jack. Thanks, James. Um, so now I'm going to do a brief review of uh, referring um, claims concerning defects. Now, obviously, defects um, is a broad area and um, there's invariably a certain amount of debate over what is and what isn't a defect. So um, I, I'm not sure I could uh, prepare something um, that was going to be exhausted on the topic, but um, uh, I'll look at it in any event on, in some of the, the main situations where issues regarding defects will arise um, concerning adjudication business. Um, uh, dealing with defects was, was perhaps not the original purpose um, of adjudication um, as, as decisions on defects can have a degree of finality about them. It does not suit the, uh, the rough and ready nature of, um, of, of the process um, and, and the potential for referring parties to hijack um, respondents. Um, but that said, it, it, it does play often an important role. Um, it, we see this in particular um, surrounding disputes concerning when practical completion has been achieved on a project and due to the very substantial financial consequences um, this can have. Um, so although perhaps not originally intended as being the, the type of dispute to be referred, um, they they are certainly the subject of um, adjudication referrals. Uh, referrals concerning um, defects during a project, uh, maybe for declarations that a defect exists or concerning rectification obligations under the contract. Additional declarations may seek a timetable 
for rectifying such defects. So I think if you're in the position of the referring party in this case, an important part is going to be in the preparation of the notice and the referral in how you frame the remedies that you are actually seeking. Um, so you would want uh, you would want the remedies that you're seeking, such as declarations, to be providing for the entitlements that are spelt out in in the contract in the specific case, uh, rather than perhaps a, 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 a blind declaration that certain work does not conform to the contract itself. Um, referrals concerning alleged defective workmanship require careful consideration. Um, the adjudicator will seek to apply the relevant terms of the contract and standard forms will generally define what a defect is and provide for the party's rights and obligations concerning allegations of defective work. Uh, for instance, concerning service of notices, um, requirements prior to certification of practical completion um, and obligations during a defects liability period or, or, or rectification period under the, um, the more recent JCT parlance. Um, so an example of this, JCT form provides that the employer may issue instructions requiring the opening up of uh, covered works or, or testing of materials or goods um, execu and executed work uh, with the cost of opening up or testing to be added to the contract sum unless the in inspection shows that the materials, goods or work are not in accordance with the contract. Um, understandably, this can lead to dispute over the findings as to whether or not that work that he's opened up and found um, is defective. In, 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 in this, type of a, this type of a case, the referral would quite often be made by the contractor on site who's unhappy with the finding of the, uh, of, of, of the party carrying out the inspection that work is defective. Now, if you're in their shoes, um, you would want to have uh, good contemporaneous evidence of what was revealed during such inspections. Um, and, and obviously that's going to have to be, arguments are going to have to be framed in the context of what the contract requires, how defects are defined, whether or not notice provisions have been complied with. So as I mentioned earlier, defects claims will often arise in uh, the context of practical completion. Um, this is uh, an area which um, which can have significant financial consequences. Again, if you are going to be involved in that sort of a claim, um, it is going to be vital that um, that, that proper inspections are being carried out. Um, but certainly, if you're acting on behalf of the uh, contractor and are being told that practical uh, completion cannot be certified, prompt action to be obtaining independent evidence um, which is scrutinising the grounds given perhaps for a, a contract administrator refusing to certify is going to be vital um, uh, and it's a very difficult sort of a case to run if, uh, if, if, if works have been uh, ongoing for some time following what the contractor believes should have been the date that the, the works were um, certified as practically complete. So in summary, the referral will require a clear statement of the issue, why the responding party is liable for the defect and uh, the consequences under the contract of, of what, that, what that defect might mean um, and would be well advised for the remedy sought to be uh, giving some sort of pathway to the solution that, that you're looking to achieve. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide, looking at the crystallization of these uh, types of disputes. Um, this is often going to be a matter of fact and degree, but needless to say, if you dispute uh, that uh, a refusal to certify practical completion, that's going to have to be put in writing and substantiated before a notice of adjudication is commenced. Now, um, a situation that often arises, um, and is certainly one that we've been witness to, is uh, parties commencing adjudication off the back of detailed expert evidence that has not been presented to the responding party in advance of the referral. Um, uh, obviously, there's, there's the thought that this could provide strategic advantage as the referring party has such little time to prepare its case and response, but um, it, this can really go two ways. Um, and uh, 
consideration should be given as to whether or not this will cast the referring party in the best light. Um, for one, they could give rise to jurisdiction arguments over whether or not the dispute has crystallised on the ground set out in whatever evidence is being presented. Um, second of all, the adjudicator is likely to take a dim view of it um, and will want to allow the responding party time to um, obtain its own evidence to whatever extent it can. Um, if uh, there's a dispute over whether or not um, it would be fair to allow the adjudication to go on, so a potential challenge to uh, jurisdiction on, on natural justice grounds, um, what will often be the case is that an adjudicator will say, well, unless uh, the referring party allows more time for the process, that they'll be stepping down. Um, so the referring party will, will, will want to ca think carefully about whether this is a situation that it wants to, um, wants to create. So moving on to the next slide. Uh, the remedy sought in the uh, notice, as I mentioned earlier, warrant careful consideration. Standard forms provide um, uh, a process for how defects should be dealt with um, and uh, a, a declaration that works to not comply with the contract may not provide the contractual mechanism to deduct the cost of remedial work since the culpable party has a right to remediate first. Um, so obviously that's uh, within the context of a defects liability period perhaps. Um, as ever with any adjudication, contract is king um, and that is, uh, that is the, the first thing that you should be referring the adjudicator to and structuring your referral around. Back over to you, James. Thanks, Jack. Um, Adjudication on professional negligence claims, um, again, like defects claims, perhaps not the original aim of, of the Construction Act, but is, is something we see being pursued um, fairly often. They have um, a, a difficulty because uh, adjudicators feel a little bit uneasy about making decisions on whether someone fell below the professional standard of care required um, in such a constrained timetable. Uh, and while there have been judgments, and I've been involved in adjudications where adjudicators have made comments um, akin to that, we also then have the, the NEC4 professional services contract, which actually has adjudication if you have option W2 as a mandatory step in, in dispute resolution. So, so even a professional services standard form is pushing the parties to adjudication in the first instance. Um, so leaving it so if it is the appropriate forum the key will be the expert report that that does not change from typical professional negligence claims in court following pantelli if you are alleging that the professional in your construction project has acted in breach of their of their duty of care you will need an independent expert um report to show that and as jack says that has to be provided in advance you have to allow the responding party time to consider the allegations being made as supported by the independent expert and comment on the same ideally before commencing your adjudication. Once the dispute is crystallized, you can then consider if adjudication is the best way to go. In particular, you may be actually better waiting for a more full response from the responding party outside the adjudication process on why they consider the, the expert report is wrong and why they consider they have met the standard required to enable you to tailor your next set of investigations and moving towards the adjudication referral um, uh, in a better way. The, the final thing to say about professional negligence adjudications, because once they get going, they, 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 they typically run as, as normal, is that it does have much more front-loaded front work because of the need for independent expert evidence. And that obviously impacts on how quickly you can bring a dispute before an adjudicator, but also costs you know, parties' costs are not recoverable typically in adjudication. There are some, there, there, there are a few ways in which you can do, but they're few and far between. And so, if you have to spend the money um, on an expert um, preparing a report, that won't be recoverable. Whereas a court procedure will be longer. But if you have to spend, you know, a considerable chunk of money on an expert, adjudication may not be the route for you. 
Uh, and then finally, on, on, on referring parties, we'll look at delay claims. And, and these do have broadly the same considerations for defects. There is the need for a clear analysis um, of, of the delay event. And that will include the contractual entitlement to an extension of time. Um, that the, the, the key event can be identified, that any relevant notices were given um, to the employer or if you're a subcontractor to your contractor. That, that statement was supported by what the cause of event was and why it is actually the risk of who would be the responding party. Um, keeping these steps set out in a simple way will allow you to tell the story to the adjudicator as to why this project is in delay and why it's not your fault. Looking at it from the other way, if you are claiming that the, the responding party has caused um, delay to the, to, to the upstream project, the same applies, that they had a programme to comply with, that for the following events they didn't comply with that programme, that has impacted on your ability to deliver um, in accordance with the contractual completion date. Um, Independent experts, again, can be useful in delay claims, although typically on the contractor and subcontractor side, they will have their own project managers and, and, and planners who are able to plot the programmes and do the regular updates with, with monthly progress reports in accordance with the contract. Having that person step back and have the consideration that this is the event that happened, this would be the impact. And also for complex claims, that not only is this the event that happened and this is the impact, that it was on the critical path and so it has had a material impact on process. Having that set out in an independent report, you know, it does tell that story for the adjudicator. Um, there sometimes is the fear that if you provide something of, of that detail, will the adjudicator be able to consider it? Yes, they will. They, they, they will be able to consider it to their best of the ability and the time. So but the easier and better cross-reference you can make it, um, the more chance you will have of being successful on the submissions you make. But that doesn't ignore the fact that there are the factual side as well. So the progress photographs, the description of the events on site all lead to the story that, you know, we need this extension of time or we are easily able to show that the other party has caused delay. So the concluding points, um, just something to touch briefly on, the ask in the, in the notice is key. If you've got a claim about money, don't just ask for a million pounds, ask for a million pounds or any other sum the adjudicator considers. If you if you define the adjudicator's description, uh, jurisdiction too narrow, you could come a cropper and you wouldn't get anything. So if the adjudicator finds that actually you're not due a million pounds, you're due 950, if it's too narrow a, a jurisdiction, he will say, well, I actually haven't got jurisdiction to make any other, other decision. It's a million or, or, or zero. And if it's not a million, it has to be zero. So you have to be careful in how you draft the notice. Um, timing is important, as I said, make sure the referral and the supporting documents are ready before the notice is served. Ensure that your referral mirrors the redress sought in the notice. You can't extend the jurisdiction in the referral. So if you if you realise in that seven days that you, 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 you fail to include something in the notice, you can't sneak it by the back door in the referral. And as a final practical point is, and this actually applies to um, responding parties too, is, is your, your evidence and submissions should be easy to navigate. Um, don't just dump lever arch files that are unpaginated or it, in the way we're working in this new world electronically, just you know, all, all mixed together with no headings. You know, show the adjudicator where, where they need to go to understand the support to, to, to statements in the referral. They're, there is nothing more frustrating for an adjudicator that, that, than scratching their head saying, well, you're saying something, but I just can't see why you're saying that. And, and it leads to a lot of questions, a lot of, a lot of additional costs that actually can be avoided if you prepare properly in the first place. So having told you how to bring an adjudication, we are now hopefully going to spend some um, time or um, going to have to rattle through it in terms of um, being a responding party and dealing with it. Um, the first thing is proactivity. As Jack said earlier, you start an adjudication at any time. So there is a degree that it could come out of the blue. So as soon as you get a whiff, whether it's the notice or hopefully something that's been given to you to try and crystallise the dispute, start investigating. The temptation might be why incur the cost now, but the more done in advance, the better. You have a limited time. 
And also this is because the adjudications can be disruptive to your business. It might not be the best time um, to deal with something during the life of it. It might be better if you just, if you have an idea of what the subject is, get a witness statement done there and then by the person who, who is more better placed to say it. Um, you need to identify the, the key staff members and any third parties that could potentially assist. And you need to pull your documents together to be able to quickly review. Because yes, you won't know the exact wording of the referral, but you should have a fair idea if the dispute has crystallized what the subject matter is. And the final point is, is, is instruct the assistance you might think you need, including lawyers and expert and obtain advice because you do have options. If, if someone is threatening an adjudication against you, you can decide whether you want to fight it, whether you want to concede. So potentially if it's a smash and grab and you realize that the payment application was valid, the payment notice wasn't issued on time. So the full value is due. Pay it, you know, in, in a way, pay it. Why incur the cost of the adjudicator as well as a foregone conclusion? Um, in the adjudication, pay it. There is always the option to negotiate, try and get the party parties to meet, to, 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 stay, to, to avoid the adjudication and try and reach a resolution or agree a different process by which to, to, to resolve the dispute. And, and the final one is obviously making, if it's a financial claim, making an offer to settle um, and see if that's a, a tempting thing for the referring party to just take what's being offered rather than running the risk of the adjudication. So hopefully you've started your, your investigation. I'll now hand you over to Jack as to what you do when you get the referral served. Thanks, James. Um, yes, yeah, so as, as already discussed, the, ref, uh, the, the notice of adjudication is what kicks off the process. Um, and in some ways, probably the most important document that's, uh, that's, reserved, uh, that's served by the referring party. Um, as it will define the powers of the adjudicator in, in dealing with the dispute. Um, and so it, it plays a key role in, in, in what the, what's called the internal jurisdiction of, of the adjudicator is. Um, on receiving the, uh, the, the notice, there are some initial things that um, as a responding party you would want to be looking at. Um, an issue that arises more than you would imagine is uh, whether or not the notice has been served properly. Um, contracts will often contain uh, notice provisions um, and this can lead to all sorts of interesting um, arguments um, uh, effectively seeking to frustrate the, the process. Uh, whether or not that's something a responding party wants to engage in um, seeing as a, a service of a further notice is unlikely to cause a huge amount of disruption um, is a, a matter of judgment at the time. Um, the other key thing when you'll receive a notice through is um, to be checking that the uh, adjudicator hasn't been approached, um, well hasn't a nomination process hasn't been commenced before service was affected. Um, and, and this is again, I mean, this is an issue I've had in, a, in an adjudication this year. And, and in fact, there was a reported case this year where nomination was sought before the, the, the notice of adjudication was sent. That was lane end developments. Um, and what that means is that jurisdiction isn't conferred on the adjudicator. Um, and so the process can't go ahead. Um, so once you receive the notice, you'll, you'll, you'll receive quite a lot of information about the claim, even if it, it will quite often be a very brief document with, with, with scant sort of factual background and without any supporting evidence. Um, but this, uh, the information contained in there, generally what, what is the dispute in, 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 in whatever terms the referring party has sought to define it, and what are the remedies that are being sought by the uh, referring party. And from that, um, jurisdictional challenges uh, that might want to be considered would, 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 would often immediately arise and it's for a responding party if they want to take that approach to be raising those concerns as soon as possible. I mean to participate in the adjudication um, despite receiving notice of potential jurisdictional issues is to accept the, um, the, 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 the nomination of the adjudicator. So um, reservations are very important and that might include um, jurisdictional challenges concerning whether or not the dispute has crystallized, um, whether or not uh, the, the notice is reporting to, 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 to commence a claim for multiple disputes, 
um, whether the, uh, the referral is for a claim under the contract or, or under more than one contract. Um, so those are the sorts of considerations, I think, on um, receiving the notice um, immediately. Um, thanks. Uh, back to you, James. Thanks, Jack. So jurisdiction is it's a it's a big topic within adjudication and actually one of the one of the questions that's already been raised is regarding um, adjudication being plagued with far too many challenges and that these can often be a, a bit of a waste of time um, obviously the key really is uh, we've got the two types internal and threshold the key will be the threshold um, challenges which relate to whether a jurisdiction should proceed if the adjudication does agree that the challenge is correct, they should resign. Um, and if they uh, reject the challenge, they should continue with the adjudication. They will continue with the adjudication. Um, but it's for the responding party to maintain that throughout the adjudication to raise the enforcement. And I think that's one one issue that parties do have with jurisdictional challenges is um, is maintaining it even though the adjudicator has already made it, made it, made his decision that there, there may well be jurisdiction so, so that that adjudication is going to continue. Because if you don't, you run the risk of not being able to raise it on enforcement and you may well have a genuine argument. So that's where jurisdiction can seem a little, little bit inept the way it's developed, but that's purely come out of the case law that says if you don't keep reserving your right to challenge, um, you will lose the right to do so at enforcement, even if you, as I say, have the genuine claim. So there are three broad um, headings for the threshold challenges. Um, sadly, because of time, I, I won't be running through them, but as I say, these will be on your slides. And we, we've touched on a few of these already, in particular, the, the no dispute crystallising. Um, the interesting one is obviously you can't have two bites of the cherry. So if you start an adjudication with adjudicator A, and they find against you, you can't start the same and hope for adjudicator B and they will get you the decision you seek. Um, so we said, you know, you've got to raise a challenge as soon as possible. There is case law out there that says that if you don't raise it when you should have done, you could have waived your right to make that challenge in the future. Um, that sounds draconian, but we're working in limited timescales and it should not be difficult to be able to make a jurisdictional submission. Um, particularly as the adjudicator can then decide how to consider it. They can defer their decision to the actual physical decision or they can, uh, they can make it sooner rather than later. Um, there are also two types. Obviously, we've got the threshold and the internal. There are also two types of jurisdiction challenges. One is general, and one is specific. Now, general is exactly what you would expect. It's all-encompassing. We think there might be a problem jurisdictionally. We reserve our right to challenge it, and we reserve our right to fight, provide more details in due course. That's fine at the start, but it's very unlikely, very, very unlikely, to be sufficient to then stand before a TCC judge and say, this is why you can't enforce this decision because we raised the general jurisdiction and lo and behold, it's come out that there may have been a problem. So specific jurisdictional challenges are really what you require in order to have any sort of viable argument for a TCC judge. Now, having a viable argument for a TCC judge is very, very different to actually having a case that can resist enforcement. And, and as, as, as Jack will go on, when we go through the case law, the, the aim of the TCC is to enforce decisions at, as far as possible you know even if there's been an error in facts and fact or law the decision will be enforced it has to be a serious jurisdictional issue that will prevent enforcement um, so we said again having raised it um, you, you need to you need to maintain your position you do have two other options if you think you have a viable jurisdictional challenge but you just want to avoid the adjudication totally you can seek to apply to court for a quick declaration as to whether the adjudicator has um, jurisdiction. Typically in these scenarios, the parties will agree to suspend the adjudication while the court deals with it. And the court can deal with it quickly. We're talking sort of 21 to 28 days that they will deal with it. Um, that runs quite a risk because if you raise a court challenge, then fees start becoming 
um, claim the ball from the other side. And if your challenge fails, as the responding party, you may actually end up having to pay the fees of that challenge to the referring party. Um, slightly more um, draconian step, I suppose, and one that is fraught with serious risk is just refuse to participate. Um, that won't end the adjudication. If the adjudicator doesn't agree with your jurisdictional challenge, that won't end it by you refusing to participate. The process will continue. The decision will be largely made on, on the referring party's referral. And you'd hope that if it's prepared quick, adequately, that, that, that the adjudicator will find in that, per, that, that party's favour. Um, and what you are effectively doing is you are just saying, get your decision, try and enforce it, and we'll challenge it. And we think we're going to be successful. But as I say, it's an option fraught with risk. And to be actually honest, in the last 15 years or so of doing adjudications, I've never seen anyone do that. Um, it's always better to participate in some way. So again, arising from our question, sometimes responding parties can get a bit lost in jurisdiction and, and forget about the other key thing, which is answering the claim. So obviously you would have hoped you'd have done your preparation in advance and you can hit the ground running and you know your main site person or the designer that was working on the project or the contract administrator is, is not on a two-week holiday wherever we can go at the moment but the, you know the, the, you, you've got the access to the people you need um the first thing when you get the referral is consider whether there's been any new evidence um, and this again is the j word jurisdiction as to whether the dispute is crystallized if the, the referring party has included a expert report they rely on as proving their case in there obviously that will be very different to you know a photograph of progress you might not have seen before or a factual explanation by the referring party as to how they came with their valuation of a certain item in their payment application and then once you've considered that the aim will be to make submissions to the adjudicator on the timetable some adjudicators have standard ideas of the timetable and then we'll wait for the parties to say well i know you say seven days but can we have 14. some may actually say i won't make any decision on the timetable until the referral served and the first thing i will ask the, the, the responding party to do is speak to the referring party and say you, you, this is the timetable uh, we require you do have to be careful obviously an obviously outlandish timetable request um, so, for example, you, you have it's one it's one line of an account. It's a couple of drawings, and you ask for for a month and a half to do do your response. You're never going to get it, and you're more likely the adjudicator will turn around and say no, seven days. Um, more and more, we are seeing that if you think you need more time, it's better for the parties to collaborate and engage, and and try and mutually say to the adjudicator, this is the timetable we consider sensible. Do you agree? Uh, and the majority of time, I think the adjudicator will agree that because it's taken it out of their hands um, and the parties are then happy with how it's going to pr progress. And again, the other jurisdiction challenges, there could be really no impact on the rights of national, natural justice because the parties are the, the people who have decided how long they need to consider the dispute. And then it's just putting together a response. And just with the, the referral, this needs to be clear, concise, cross-referenced, you know, considering all the relevant matters to do with the claim. But a, a, a problem you sometimes have is, is you know, answering every single sentence of the referral. You don't need to do that. There are key issues that you can address, and that's what you should be, be addressing. And obviously attached to it will be any um, factual evidence witness statements and documents that you will rely on. Um, the, the remainder of the adjudication is at the adjudicator's discretion along the lines of the timetable. They won't allow endless submissions. You may have a rejoinder um, after the reply um, if it's considered necessary. Um, the, the adjudicator will raise queries, so you've got to be ready to act. So that's also part of your preparation, the fact that the people you are working with are available for the whole duration. If you if you are relying on an expert, an expert can say, I can get the report to you and I can look at the response, but then I'm on holiday for two weeks. Well, they might not be around to deal with any adjudicators questions or meetings. Um, and then you get your shiny decision. Um, the adjudicators decisions are 
no 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 one drafts it the same they all have their different um layouts and, and how they've approached the issues but obviously as a party to the education you need to review it quickly you need to review for any potential challenges um in, including if um that the adjudicator has made a decision that, that they did not have jurisdiction to to to, to give and then, and then you have to comply with the award. Financial awards typically are paid with you within seven days. Um, and, and if you don't, that will be the, the grounds to challenge enforcement to, and, and the referring party will seek to enforce. And as we've said, there are very limited grounds. So all you're actually doing is increasing your financial exposure because you will have to pay the costs of the enforcement on the basis that it's successful. Um, we're, we're, we're really pushed for time and obviously there's been some key cases this year that, that, that Jack um, is going to run through. So this is enforcement in brief. If you need more on enforcement, please get in, get in touch. It's a quick pr process um, and, and really the bones are on this slide. Um, and, and I think it would probably be more beneficial to actually look at the cases that we've seen with, 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 with enforcement recently. So I'll hand it back over to Jack. Thanks, James. Okay, so um, I'm going to very quickly review a few of the um, key cases this year um, regarding um, adjudication enforcement. Um, as a, as a, an, an area of law, adjudication has largely been formed out of decisions over, over the last 25 years, as the, the Construction Act itself only really contained a few sections. So uh, much of much of the, the process, I mean, the, the entire process of enforcement of decisions is judge made. Um, due to the rough and ready nature of um, the way decisions are reached, um, often parties are unhappy and will seek to resist enforcement one way or another. Um, and, and all of the um, judgments uh, I, I tend to speak about now are, are regarding um, parties on the wrong side of decisions um, looking to avoid uh, the court enforcing uh, the judgment through through summary um, judgment um, either by way of uh, well and, 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 and in the context of insolvency for um, giving a stay of execution so the first one is um, uh, the, the, the major case of the last year and, and this is the only um, uh, well, the, only the second uh, adjudication decision by the um, by the Supreme Court. That's Bresco and um, Lonsdale, and this concerned the rights of parties um, in liquidation. So, of liquidators, effectively, of, of, of referring disputes to adjudication, um, and uh, th that's going to have a very significant bearing. Um, on the rights and and approach taken by liquidators. Um, the second, um, which came immediately off the back of um, Bresco, was uh, John Doyle and Erith. Um, and um, this, this was a judgment by uh, Fraser, um, where he's setting out if uh, the, the guidelines for if a decision is made in favour of a, uh, a company that is in liquidation, um, in what circumstances that um, uh, decision might be enforced by the court. Um, the third um, is uh, JRT Developments and TW Dixon, which is um, quite well, a very unusual decision um, uh, where enforcement of a smash and grab referral has, um, has been successfully resisted on grounds of uh, uh, manifest injustice arising from the enforcement, um, uh, which get, runs contrary really to the court's approach to enforcing um, decisions, but um, it's perhaps quite well contained to its facts. So moving on to um, Bresco, and I'll try to keep this relatively swift. <laughs> um, so as I, as I mentioned, regarding the right of a, um, a company in liquidation to uh, refer claims to adjudication, uh, it's been long established that parties could not, re uh, that, that companies in liquidation could not um, uh, refer a claim against um, uh, a, a solvent um, company if that company had a cross claim going the other way, and that's going all the way back to Boyd's and Dahl Jensen about 20 years ago. Um, now, the, uh, th this, 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 this judgment was a long way in the making. Um, the head of the TCC at the time, and Justice Fraser, 
originally um, found for the uh, the party resisting um, enforcement. Um, uh, Coulson um, agreed in part with that decision, but um, opening up a sort of a chink. Um, and the Supreme Court has um, completely overturned the position that it existed for the previous 20 years, uh, which, as I mentioned earlier, is the potential to create a new market for um, liquidators uh, enforcing, uh, well, bringing uh, adjudications and seeking to enforce decisions. So, um, moving on, um, the background to this, both electrical contractors um, involving a project at 6 St James Square, and there's a picture of it for you. So, in 2016, uh, Bresco entered insolvent liquidation. Um, there were cross claims in this instance. Um, so, uh, Bresco claimed it was owed money, um, uh, and uh, Lonsdale, in turn, claimed it was owed money. So, um, claims going in both directions. Um, in uh, uh, on entering liquidation, I mean, the, the, the key the key issue here is that under the insolvency rules, so this is rule 14.25, on entering um, insolvent liquidation, uh, there's an immediate self-executing insolvency set off. And what this means is that claims going in either directions between the parties are all set off for, against each other. And what the, uh, the liquidator is left with is its assessment of a net balance, which um, it would usually determine internally based on proofs of debt. Um, obviously, obviously, for liquidators, this is very difficult uh, when dealing with significant construction insolvencies. Um, and there are some quite tricky policy considerations involved with whether or not adjudication as a temporarily binding process is, um, is, 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 is a suitable um, dispute resolution process to be allowed um, to a company in liquidation, which in itself is a very temporary organisation um, where funds are in all likelihood going to be um, spent pretty damn quick and, uh, and, and the whole thing folded up. So moving on to the next slide. Um, The, uh, the two arguments, and this has been the basis of the, the position for, um, for, part, for, for liquidators looking to, um, to, to refer disputes, uh, why they have been unable is um, previously, but the, the two arguments that were made by um, uh, Lonsdale uh, in, in, in each set of the proceedings was that um, because of the cross claim, the claims could cancel each other out. So the resulting uh, net balance under the under the insolvency um, set off wasn't actually a claim under the building contract itself at all. Um, and this succeeded uh, before Fraser. Um, uh, it, it wasn't successful um, before Coulson in the Court of Appeal, though. Um, However, the second issue, which was uh, was accepted, and that, and that was that adjudication should referred by a company liquidation should not be allowed to proceed because the process uh, was futile. Um, the decision would not be enforced in any event in favour of a company liquidation, save for what um, Coulson described as extraordinary circumstances. And so uh, resisting enforcement um, was 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 sensible. Now, the court, uh, the Supreme Court, has overruled on both of these points, um, and um, in doing so, what it's found is that um, effectively the right of a of a company in liquidation to refer a dispute to adjudication is a is 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 a good in itself and something that a liquidator should be entitled to do, um, irrespective of whether or not that. Um, that decision uh, is, is likely to be um, enforced. Um, so this is obviously a very significant change, particularly for main contractors who could potentially be facing a significant number of, um, of referrals by uh, liquidators on what could be very historic claims. Um, so the, I mean, the point in principle is yes, the uh, the the adjudicate uh, the referring liquidator can now refer the claim to adjudication 
um, and is entitled to receive a decision, um, the Supreme Court has now really left it um, all, all of the difficulties arising from the uh, insolvency situation to uh, the courts at enforcement, whether or not they decide to enforce the um, enforce the judgment. So, yes, I think I might have. Yes, I, I just I've, I've already covered this. <laughs> Move on to the next one. Okay, so uh, like I said, the futility issue decided it. Uh, the uh, right to refer a claim to adjudication was a statutory and contractual right, and it'd be inappropriate for the court to intervene, um, and found that it was a, uh, a simple and proportionate method for liquidators to determine um, and assess a proofs of debt. Um, now, the question remains, is this really how adjudication is likely to be used by adjudicators? Uh, I think the reality of all of these claims that's been referred is that they have all been um, claims that have been uh, supported by external funders. Um, and the theme seems to be that um, the, the claims being um, either, either purchased by external parties or, um, or, or, being, or security is being offered by them. Um, and um, it, it, it's, a, it's a question of, 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 of policy, whether or not uh, that's a, a new industry that, um, that, that, that the courts really want to um, support. But um, like I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court decision has left problems to be dealt with at the enforcement stage. So uh, the Supreme Court endorsed the approach um, for security of costs, and this is in its commentary on, on how enforcement should be dealt with. Um, so the, 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 the consideration for the uh, party in liquidation should be what kind of a claim can now be um, enforced at the final stage what steps need to be put in place to make that uh, decision enforceable rather than i suppose dealing with the initial arguments about whether the adjudicator should be making any sort of a decision or would have power to make any sort of decision at all so that leads neatly on to the the john doyle case so this again i i, I think this is probably a good example of the sorts of problems that allowing um, companies in, in liquidation, um, uh, liquidators to, to commence claims can create. This was a, John Doyle um, was a groundworks contractor for Erith and um, Erith was engaged by BAM on, um, on the Olympic Park project. Um, so doing hard landscaping worked um, back in 2012, um, and off the back of that, um, John Doyle entered into liquidation um, back in, in, in 2012. Um, so after that, this, this claim has been sitting around, an agreement was reached with funders um, for John Doyle to be able to pursue this claim through adjudication with their assistance. And it was commenced in 2018. They claimed, I think, about four million pounds, and in the adjudication were awarded 1.2 million. Um, in the judgment, Fraser found for Erith and, and refused enforcement of the decision, um, and it decided that um, John Doyle um, had provided inadequate security for um, uh, Eris claim, uh, cross claims, um, as well as um, inadequate security for uh, Eris costs in bringing such a claim. I, I think the key though is the principles that um, have come out of this, and, and this is off the back of the Meadowside decision in 2019 about when a company in liquidation can enforce um, a decision. Uh, the first of those principles is has the adjudicator considered the entire financial dealings between the parties under the construction contract in question. Now, Fraser was quite direct 
in uh, um, addressing the question of whether um, uh, a claim for a default entitlement, so a smash and grab referral, would be suitable. Um, and, and clearly it won't be. Uh, really, the only types of claims that party liquidation are going to be able to refer are, 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 are final account type disputes or, or disputes arising perhaps from terminations where all matters between the parties are being under the contract being resolved at the same time. So that's the, that's the key uh, first issue. Uh, the second uh, is whether there are dealings outside the contract. Now, it's going to be a matter of fact and degree whether those dealings outside of the contract are um, sufficient to persuade the court. Um, what, when I say dealings outside the contract, I mean whether there's a dispute that wasn't under the, 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 the dispute that was referred um, in relation to a completely separate set of dealings. Um, it's going to be, a, a, if, if there are, then that, that goes to the question of whether or not the decision is a decision of the final rights of the parties, um, uh, which is what the, the court would look to allow. Um, uh, uh, the third are uh, whether or not defences were, um, were not deployed in the adjudication. Um, and the fourth is um, whether or not, I mean, this is vitally important whether the liquidator would be prepared to offer the necessary undertakings um, to allow um, the part paying party to repay um, sums uh, uh, to, to, well, to claim for the, uh, the claim going in the other direction in any subsequent litigation. Uh, the key point here is that any sum that might be um, awarded in favour of the company in liquidation would need to be ring fenced and kept separate from the liquidation, i.e., not dissipated to the creditors in the in the liquidation um, until such point um, as the other party has has bought its claim, I mean, unless it decides not to bring um, a, a, a claim for a final resolution to litigation or arbitration. Um, and uh, in addition to that, usually they'd be requiring. Uh, some security for the costs in uh, in pursuing that claim. So uh, the upshot of this really is that for a, a, a claimant liquidator to succeed, it's going to need very significant financial backing. Um, it's either going to need to be a very rich liquidator, which uh, are, are going to be relatively few and far between dealing with construction insolvencies, or it's going to need very good third party um, support for the for the matter which can satisfy the courts that if the if the decision is enforced and subsequent litigation is commenced that um, the other party is going to be put right um, okay so I think we'll move on to the final the final one now very briefly J this is JRT developments and TW Dixon um, as I mentioned an unusual case from October 2020 October 2020 uh, in the TCC list in Birmingham. Uh, this is picking up on a decision um, Galliford Tri and Asturia back in, in, in 2015. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, consideration of exceptional circumstances when a smash and grab referral will not be enforced. Now, in this case, um, the, the two companies were, were, were effectively run by family members for a, for a, for a housing um, development where JRT was running the project on behalf of TW Dixon. Um, the payment provisions of the contract weren't complied with at all at any stage. JRT was um, uh, responsible for securing external funding, I think from the Ministry of Housing or, or, or some external agency like that. Um, what happened was there was a termination and then JRT submits its final um, account which TW Dixon perhaps surprisingly does not issue a uh, payment notice or pay less notice in response to then seeks um, enforcement of the um, smash and grab um, adjudicators decision that the uh, one million odd claim was due. Now the uh, in this case um, the judge decided that it would obviously be manifestly unjust in those circumstances to enforce um, a decision, um, but obviously that turned on some relatively extraordinary circumstances. Um, I think it's pretty safe to say that this um, should not be giving um, contractors and employers much confidence that they're going to have much luck 
resisting default payment obligations um, in a standard commercial context. Um, but in any event, um, uh, another interesting um, another interesting turn and, and more potential for us lawyers to make arguments, no doubt. Back over to you, James. Thank you, Jack. Well, um, thank you for those that remain on. Um, apologies for overrunning. Obviously, adjudication is a very big topic um, with lots of nuances. Um, and we've tried to condense it as much as we can to give you this um, practical guide as well as case law update. Um, we don't have time for questions, sadly. Uh, we dealt with one during it, which was regarding far too many jurisdictional challenges and hopefully the reasons why, but there will obviously remain still some challenges that made that, that perhaps don't have much um, weight behind them and you query why they should have, whether they should have been raised in the first place. But that's that is the nature of the beast. Um, if you do have any questions arising out of, of this webinar, please feel free to drop me or Jack a line. Um, as we said earlier, this, the slides for this adjudication will be will be sent out afterwards. So just leaves me to say thank you so much for um, listening to us today and joining us. Um, we'll be sending a, a diary out for any further um, webinars we'll be running in the near future. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.